Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I know that this is YSI South Asia and that you had really wanted me to talk about work, women working in South Asia. Uh, but I have looked only at India for this lecture because, you know, I further, uh, uh, further research about this uh, and the problem. Uh, Kushbu, uh, can you unmute mute yourself? Sorry, ma'am. Sorry about that. No, no, that's fine. And uh, so I'm not looking at other countries because the patterns are really quite different. It's really similar only to some extent in Pakistan, but not even fully. Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, as you know, they have a very different pattern with a significant increase in women's workforce participation in export-oriented industries over the last three decades. This has not been the case in India, and we are sort of unusual even in our own region for that reason. On the other hand, because India is such a large country, whatever happens in India drags down the rest of the region, and in fact, it drags down the developing world as well. So there are unusual patterns that I want to look at specifically. I also want to note that, you know, it's very fitting that you're beginning this on May Day. Uh, I'm happy that you have chosen May Day, the International Working Workers' Day, because women are workers. Uh, Alicia Giron, who is here as well, knows this. All women are workers, whether they're recognized as workers or not. I would say 90% of women are workers. And in fact, in India, we have data to prove that as well. Uh, but if we uh, recognize that women are workers, then it's quite interesting to think that May Day has very rarely recognized this role of women, not just in India, but globally. And so it's time that we realize that, you know, we have to think about women as workers specifically on the days in which we remember and think of how to take forward the workers' movement. Also, I, I just want to recognize that we are in a period of unbelievable crisis in India. And I want to salute all of you for carrying on and for not uh, letting yourselves get devastated to that extent to keep this thing going. It's very important, it's very essential that we do not lose sight of our other roles and activities as researchers, as academics, as people who are trying to change things for the better by understanding them despite the horrific things that are happening all around us. And I just want to salute all of you for that. And uh, we are all in this together, this particular crisis, not all. I mean, there are some who are not in it, unfortunately. There are some who are profiting from it. There are some who are um, have caused it, not to put too fine a point on it. Yet, I think the solidarity that I have seen among my friends, my colleagues, my students, somehow we will get through this and even this shall pass. Okay, now what's the basic backdrop in India? One of these startling features, now this is only the very recent trend, that is to say for the last uh, you know, 18 years or so, between 2004, five, and the latest data that we have, which is 2017, 18. When I say latest data, I'm referring to the large surveys conducted by the National Sample Survey of India. And, uh, if you looked from 1993 onwards, you would see a further decline. But nonetheless, this is a really a striking decline because remember that this is the period of economic growth in India. This was India's boom. And despite that, you're seeing significant declines in the employment rate. That is the recognized work participation rate. Uh, it's a decline for both men and women, remarkably, uh, as you can see from the left-hand side. Uh, but it's much sharper for women. And remember, it was beginning at a much lower base. Now, you will find that these numbers are a little higher than the numbers that are normally presented. And that's really because of the fact of the different age groups that are normally taken. Yeah. And uh, so this is the 15 plus age group. And you will see that there's a significant decline. And the biggest decline is in rural India. If you look at the right hand side, that's very, very sharp decline in work participation rates. In urban India, it hasn't declined so much, but mainly because of the fact that it was already very, very low. Okay, and you can't really go less than 18. Well, you can. If the CMIE surveys are to be believed, we are now at 11%. And Varsha will tell you that in some states like Bihar, even the, the labor force participation surveys gave us 2% women's 
employment rate. So we are talking about unbelievably low rates of recognized work participation. But remember that this is only employment or what the ILO calls work for remuneration. And this is a subset of total work. Thanks to the changed ILO definition of work, which should have happened a long time ago, but it happened in 2013, we recognize now that work is any activity that prov provides goods and services for the community, for the household, or for yourself. So it's anything that you cannot delegate. Now, this is very important because think of the things you can delegate. You can delegate practically everything. A whole range of things that are not defined as work can actually be recognized once you note the fact that they can be delegated. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Especially activities related to physical reproduction, these are not defined as, you know, when women are doing this, they're not defined as being in the labor force. When you are giving birth to a child, it's a, you know, mothering and so on. This is, you're not in the labor force. Yet, if you think about it, these are all activities that can be delegated. Breastfeeding, for example, Okay, it's actually an activity that historically has been delegated. Through the ages, you have had women wet nurses in different societies. The elite has used, you know, women from poorer households, etc., to outsource the breastfeeding of children. When this happens, that's an economic activity. When a mother does it for her own child, it's not. Okay, which is, when you think about it, logically not really sustainable. The very act of childbirth itself, it's assumed that this is something that uh, cannot be outsourced. Yet we do know that there are now surrogate mothers. In fact, there was a point at which this was the fastest growing export of the state of Gujarat at the time when Mr. Modi was the chief minister. The uh, service of delivering babies for other people. And that was definitely an economic activity in which you know, money changed hands, women were paid for this. Yet when a woman gives birth to her own child, she's considered as not in the labor force. In fact, think of the terms we use, you know, maternity leave, as if this is like, you know, a bit of a paid holiday for the woman concerned rather than work. So you, you can see how we have a rather inadequate notion of work. And so we shouldn't really be calling it work participation. We should be calling it employment participation because it is only work for remuneration. In India, this is further complicated because when we look at the employment rate, even that contains a number of features that are uh, you know, really not uh, relevant uh, in, in the sense that um, when you look at the codes, uh, um, the employment codes, you know, they include women unpaid workers in family enterprises. So those are also not paid, but they're still defined as working, whereas the women who are doing a whole range of other things are not defined as working. Okay, what do we find? We find that in India, women are dominantly in unpaid work. Okay, uh, there's the NSS code 92, which refers to attending to domestic duties only. Now, what does that mean? That refers to the entire care economy, that looking after the young, the old, the sick, and the other household members who require care cooking, cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the entire range of domestic work. And there's code 93, which are women who do these activities, but also do a lot of other things like collecting vegetables, roots, firewood, cattle feed, and water. Water is a very big one. I'll come back to that. Collecting water and collecting firewood, but water is even more significant. And a, a bunch of other things, you know, tailoring, sewing, weaving, things you do for household use, making pots, whatever. If you count all of that, then just to give you an example, in, in, in 2011-12, women's workforce participation was really quite low. It was in the range of 24% in the employment sense. But once you count all of these other activities, it was as high as 86% and higher than men, okay? So 86% compared to around 80% for men. And note that, you know, what is, what, when we talk about women's work in India, we say, why aren't more women working? Well, they are working. It's just that they are not recognized as working. So what do we find? What's this big decline in women's employment rates? It's really a shift from paid to unpaid work. 
And that's why we have to look much more closely at what's going on in terms of that pattern. So the absence of basic immunities is clearly an important factor. If you look at, again, 11-12, you find 40% of women in rural areas and more than one-fifth in urban areas had to fetch water for household consumption. And uh, among the poorest women, more than half, both water and firewood. Now notice that this is partly because there is an absence of piped water and so on, but it's also because the time involved in collecting water has actually increased significantly. The NSS surveys have also found this, that it takes longer to collect water, there are more trips required, you have to walk longer distances, you have to wait longer at the place where we will collect the water, especially in urban areas, you have to queue up and so on. And of course, this is something essential, you can't do without water, yes? Uh, when the NSS surveys ask the women why you do this, they say there's nobody else in the household to do it. It's women and girls, it's the job of women and girls to do this. We also have now the results of a time use survey that was conducted in 2019, 20, no, sorry, 1819. And you find that there's a massive gender gap in the unpaid activities. Now look, these numbers refer to the age group 59, uh, 15 to 59, okay? So not the elderly, not the young. And we do know that a number of girls below the age of 15 are also involved in all of these. But right now I'm just taking this to give you an indication. Now just compare, uh, look at the last column, just, you know, just as an indication. Of course, the urban and rural, there are variations, but let's just look at the last set of columns. How many men are involved in paid activities according to this time use survey? 68.5% of men. How many women? 20.6 are involved in paid activities. How many men are involved in unpaid activities? About, for, about just under half, okay? And yes, there are always some unpaid activities around the home that men also do. But for women, 94% are involved in unpaid activities. So this whole notion that women are not working, it's obviously. Note also, therefore, that means that many of the women who are doing the paid work are also having to do unpaid work, the double burden is very significant. And even among those who are doing the unpaid activities, there's a huge gender gap in the amount of time you have to spend. So now let me just look at the last columns again. We will leave aside the differences among urban and rural for the time being. Uh, you can come back to these, uh, of course, I'm sure this presentation will be shared and look at it in more detail. But consider the aspect of uh, this is the minutes per day okay so this is you'd have to divide by 60 to get the hours but broadly speaking look at the difference in terms of the minutes per day spent on unpaid activities and it's nearly three times well actually no but it's more like two and a half times women spend more than two and a half times what men do in the unpaid activities even when some of them are having to spend a significant amount of time in paid activities. And that also means they have less time for what is called here residual. Now residual is a range of things. It's not just your own leisure. It's social activities, it's participation in broader public life. You know, all of the other things which are not either work or unpaid work at home. And that too, women have less time for, which means they also therefore have less time, not just for uh, uh, their own leisure, but also for what can be called uh, the um, participation, if you like, the relational activities in the community and in the family and so on. And this gives you even more detail in terms of the uh, time spent. Basically, men have more time for themselves, broadly speaking, in self-care and maintenance, as it's called. Okay, which you can see over here. The socializing and so on, again, men have more time. And that matters because that also affects your ability to have social political voice. And it also, you know, human beings are social beings. We are relational, we need that as well. It's insufficiently recognized. Okay. 
what does this mean? There are huge implications for the labor market. And I think that's what we have to bear this in mind when we're looking at the labor market tendencies. This massive engagement in unpaid work and the fact that you then have a, for women, this unpaid to paid work continuum, it has huge implications for when women do enter the labor market, okay? It devalues women and it devalues the work they do, both. Society doesn't recognize the work they do. It doesn't think, the typical answer to a lot of surveys given by the male heads of households is, oh, my wife is at home, she doesn't do anything. Uh, and uh, that, of course, uh, devalues women. We also know that it affects the bargaining power of women within their families. But society as a whole tends to devalue women and the work they do. It also means that when women do enter the labor markets, their wages are lower than men. Not just because they have lower reservation wages, that is, they are willing to work for lower wages, but because so much of the work they do is free anyway. So, you know, society does not feel that it has to reward them. And so there are very big gender gaps, and I will show you the extent of the gender gaps. In fact, um, there are people who are working on this now. The extent of the gender gap varies dramatically with the extent of unpaid work. In the societies where many, many more women are doing more unpaid work within the households, you will find bigger gender gaps. And this is true within the states of India, but it is also true across the world and the developing world in general. It also means that women uh, tend to cluster in certain occupations, which are seen as women's work, a lot of the care activities and so on. And it, once they cluster, they are lower paid. And what is interesting is that this wage penalty even extends to men who are doing similar work. So the low paid care sector, you know, if you're a man, men nurses, men, uh, you know, attendants, et cetera, all get lower paid. So the wage penalty extends even to men doing similar work as those in the occupations where women are clustered. Now, remember that this unpaid work also provides a huge subsidy to the recognized economy and to the so-called formal sector. It's unrecognized and it's never really counted, but basically you are contributing to all this creation of the so-called national income in terms of the paid activities which are done by unrewarded workers. And this has significant implications for aggregate labor productivity in the economy. Um, you know, we in India have prided ourselves on rising labor productivity, but a lot of that is because of the fact that GDP is rising at a time when employment is falling. And uh, it's the unpaid work which is contributing as a subsidy to that rise. I mentioned to you that we have very large gender wage gaps. This is again from the labor force survey of 2017-18. You can see we have some of the largest in the world in terms of the difference between men and women workers. That's true across regular employment. Now remember regular employment is not formal necessarily. It's just anything that you do regularly over the year. It's a subset, a very small subset of that is formal work. Most of it is informal. And some of it, even government employment, like Anganwadi workers, ashas, et cetera, they are all classified as regular workers. And yet, as we know, they don't even get minimum wages. So women in the regular work, there's a significant gender wage gap. Casual work, even larger wage gap. But the biggest one is in self-employment. Just look at that hugely different returns on self-employment for men and women. And that tells you about a whole range of other constraints that women in micro enterprises and women who are self-employed face when they are trying to actually generate adequate incomes. We can come back to that in the questions if you like, but it is a very important part that is rarely noted because half of our informal workers are self-employed. And so it matters what conditions they are operating under. Uh, you will notice that the average return was about less than 5,000 rupees a month in 2017-18. Certainly nowhere near a living wage. But this average masks the fact that there is a bunching at the bottom. The median, this is the, mo this is the mean. If you looked at the median wage, that was closer to about 3,500. And uh, I mean, I don't know whether Varsha has looked at modes, but you will find that there is really 
people, women are clustered at the lower end and it's a few high end, uh, which is bringing up the mean. So as I mentioned, in rural areas, gender gaps are even higher and especially among self-employed. And uh, you will see this is the female wages as a proportion of the male wage. And imagine they're getting less than 40% of what men get as self-employed workers. But also these other wage gaps in terms of casual work, in terms of, these are among the highest in the world. Very, very high gender wage gaps in India, which reflect the preponderance of unpaid work among women. We find that these have declined a little bit for regular work, not for any good reason, because men's wages are coming down, okay? So this gender gap decline, we shouldn't be celebrating it necessarily. We find over this period that a lot of male wages did not increase, and that's why the gender wage gap came down for regular work. But they actually increased for private casual work. Remember that the, um, the only one that really seems to work in terms of less gender wage gap is the Rural Employment Guarantee Act. And you can look at that here. It's the second last of the set of columns. And you will find that there's an improvement in terms of the female wage as a share of male. And it's close to 93%, which is not too bad, considering how terrible all the gender wage gaps are elsewhere. Yes. Yet urban casual work, it's increased the gender wage gap, it's the share has come down. And in general, private casual work, you find that the gender gaps have increased. Now, you know, when the 2017, 18 results came out, a lot of people were saying, well, look, regular work has increased and women, there are more women in regular work, isn't that a great thing and so on? No, it only increased because overall employment fell, in other words, you know, when you look at regular work as a share of total work, the, all that happened is the total employment of women fell. And so it wasn't a reflection of any improvement. If you look at the 15 plus share of women in all work, it went down. Am I making sense, right? Total employment as a share of the 15 plus falls, within that the share of regular work increases, but it doesn't mean that the absolute numbers are increasing. Yeah, it means that all are falling, it's just that regular work is falling at a slightly lower rate. And a lot of that has to do with public employment, which Varsha can tell you a lot more about, and Deepa will tell you a lot more about. And it's a lot of that regular employment is often work under terrible conditions, with no uh, benefits, no social security, not even minimum wages, very little protection, et cetera, et cetera, all of those concerns. I want to come back to another issue. I want to go back to the Chinese and I want to just talk about one other thing. And that has to do with time poverty. And this is something I haven't, I haven't put into these slides, but I just want to talk about it a little bit because I think it's an aspect that we don't normally think about when we are looking at women's work. This is something Diane Elson highlighted way back in the early 1990s when she wrote about the double burden of paid and unpaid work for women. And she talked about how government structural adjustment policies are adding dramatically to this double burden. But I think we don't realize in India the extent to which time poverty impacts not just on the well being of uh, women workers themselves, but on the well being of their own households. And what I'm really arguing is that time poverty adds to income poverty, which is something that's not necessarily always recognized. You know, it's seen as one more dimension of poverty along with all the other multidimensional aspects. The time poverty is another dimension of poverty. I'm saying that it's worse. It's not just the same as lack of education, lack of access to health, lack of proper housing. It adds to material poverty in different ways. And let me try and explain what I mean. We know that, in fact, it's the poor who are more time poor. You know, that, that whole idea that uh, the time poor are all these rich executives who are flying around the world, or they used to fly around the world, and do their PowerPoint presentations on their flight and so on, they are the time poor. Well, that's actually a very minor and almost uh, negligible share of the time poor. The most time poor people are the income poor people. 
Why? Because they cannot afford to outsource. They cannot afford to delegate a lot of other work. They cannot afford to buy processed items. They cannot afford to hire people to do a whole range of their other work. They have to do it themselves. Okay. Uh, when you know, uh, when I was a teacher in India, I was able to go out and lecture and do a blah 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 because I could hire a woman who would come and clean the house and do various other domestic duties. She could not hire anyone else. She had to go home and do her own domestic duties. And this goes down the line. You will find always, all the time your survey suggests that the lower you go down the income scale, the more time poor people are, and particularly women are. And women are always more time poor than men, as we have seen that this thing shows very clearly. What does that mean? It means that, first of all, among the poor, that there is the absolute material deprivation of the woman concerned. I mean, there's the, you know, there's the real lack of social and relational time, there's the lack of leisure time, the lack of sleep time, all of those things, okay? But it also means that the unpaid goods and services that the woman provides are necessarily of worse quality. They, because she will not have time to provide proper services of the cooking, cleaning, care variety. She will simply not be able to provide those. Um, Nancy Folbray, who has written a lot on the care economy, gives an interesting example from the United States, but we can apply that to South Asia as well. Supposing you have two families, both of whom earn 10,000 rupees a month, okay? And one of them, there's a man who earns 10,000 rupees and the woman stays at home and, you know, looks after the kids, cooks, cleans, blah, blah, blah. In the other household, you have a man and a woman who are both working, who both earn 5,000 rupees a month. Now on the face of it, per capita income of these two households is identical, right? But in the second case, the woman, let's face it, it'll be the woman, will have to come work all day and then come home and cook, clean, blah, blah, all of that, and will really not be able to give the same level of services or will not be able to provide similar care for the children. Simply will not be able to, there will not be the time for that. I like to give an example that my friend P. Sainath, the journalist had long time ago, I think it was 2007 written, he followed a group of women in a district in Maharashtra. He followed them around for a week. And he came back, he told me that he was completely exhausted and just couldn't move for a few days, just following their activities, not even doing them. These women, uh, they used to, they were in a small town in a rural district. So it was a smallish town and there were just simply no employment activities available and the men were not earning enough to allow for survival. So the women used to go and search for work in groups. They would get up at four o'clock in the morning and you know, cook something for the day, uh, for the whole household, sweep, et cetera, and then begin this trek to the railway station which was five kilometers away. They walked to the railway station, got onto the train, ticketless, of course, Gondia district, that's right, in Maharashtra. They got to the, they drew, They uh, went ticketless because they had bribed the conductor and you know they could manage to get the ticket collector and they could manage to be on it pretty much on these trains and go to this nearby area where there was agricultural work, usually harvesting and so on. And I think in that particular region, it was wine related, that is grapes and so on. Anyway, they would work all day. They would work all day, a full day's agricultural labor. I don't know if any of you has ever tried it. I did not last two hours. They would work the full day, then get back on the train and then get back home walking and reach home around 11. When they would somehow eat something and go back to sleep to get up again the next day at four o'clock in the morning. There was one woman he spoke to who said that she had a seven-year-old son whom she had not spoken to for seven months, for six months, because every time she came home, he was asleep. So clearly the quality of the care that could be provided by these women, it's not just that they had terrible lives, it's not just that they were deeply time poor, but also that the quality of the goods and services was significantly less. In other words, that the material poverty was added to by the time poverty. Once again, I want to emphasize that this is something that is never noted in public policy discussions. It just never comes up as an issue. Okay, all this bad news and then there's more to come, which is the pandemic. 
this all of this happened before the latest wave all the terrible things that happened to women as workers as consumers as providers for their families as women engaged in reproductive activities all of these things had already worsened dramatically before the second wave i don't even want to think about what is happening in the second wave but what we do know already is that women were much more likely to lose paid employment disproportionately the surveys by the cmie tell us that you know women's workforce participation in, have gone down to 8% if that is possible in other words we do know and a lot of work by stephanie seguino elisa brownstein and others has shown that wherever jobs are scarce women get rationed out of them so they get rationed first out of the good jobs you know the paid employment in formal sector and in manufacturing they get rationed out of that and then when jobs overall are scarce then they get rationed out of those and we have seen this so clearly throughout the pandemic but especially in india that they disproportionately job loss they were already a tiny share of the recognized workforce when now they've even declined further but what is worse is that they were much more likely to be informal the 2017-18 survey tells us i think 98.6% did not have all three of the indicators of social protection which is to say paid leave signed contract and some form of social security so they already had less social protection you lose your job you have nothing if you're self employed of course you're completely on your own but even those who had employers they really didn't have the legal or social protection we know that women dominate in the care activities and all the frontline work in you know sanitation and health and so on and we also know that many of them in public employment who are absolutely at the front line much more prone to infection much more dealing face to face with the communities and so on are not recognized as employees that is to say they are seen as volunteers which means you don't have to give them minimum wages you don't have to give them any of the basic worker conditions which meant that throughout this pandemic they were first denied physical protection they didn't get protective gear they had more likelihood of infection they many you know the much uh, hyped announcement of social security for health workers and others it seems only one third of them received any kind of social security even health insurance for infections received during the course of their duty during the pandemic in many states because the states were facing massive fiscal crunch they were not even paid their wages and we also know that they have been facing social discrimination seen as carriers of infection mistreated by communities and so on we know that the lockdown has meant increased domestic violence uh, wherever there are reliable records uh, the frustrations and tensions of being unable to earn a living and the other kinds of tensions associated with the pandemic have led many men to basically lash out at those whom they can afford to lash out against uh, and significant increase in domestic violence we know that the nutrition of women and girls has been disproportionately reduced we already had horrifying indicators of child undernutrition even before the pandemic because of inadequate state investment in this now we've had falling household incomes reduced food access midday meals not been provided in anganwadis and schools and it's uh, the nutrition picture is beyond horror and of course we know that girls education has been affected disproportionately and it's not just the closure of schools but you know this whole shift to online education survey after survey has found that wherever there is one mobile phone in the family uh, it is the son who will get access to it for the schooling rather than the daughter and and all kinds of other you know ways in which the gender differences have been not just reinforced but they've actually been created by this i need not emphasize that all of this is a man made catastrophe and i emphasize man or shall i say men made catastrophe it's really because of the way in which the lockdown was implemented brutally without planning without adequate compensation for those who lost livelihoods without any attempt to consider the welfare of the masses of millions or hundreds of millions of informal workers the way in which public transport was denied to those who had no option but to try and go home somehow to survive 
the continuing insensitivity and lack of any kind of public preparedness, the denial of uh, resources to state governments when they were the ones left responsible to deal with the calamities created by central decisions, then the complete lack of any planning or recognition of the possibility of a second wave, the you know, vain glorious uh, uh, declarations that we have conquered this pandemic, even as infections of new variants were already spreading from January onwards. And then the encouragement of super spreader events, like the bringing forward of the Kumbh Mela by a full year on the advice of astrologers, the holding of massive election rallies, which have become huge super spreader events, and then the lack of willingness to accept any responsibility for this, or to realize that the central government must step in with more resources directly and through state governments. The, in a, the un, inability to vaccinate the population, even though they could have issued compulsory licenses to 10 other domestic producers, including six public sector units to produce these vaccines so that we could have had enough to actually meet half the population's needs. But instead you chose to privilege only two private producers and you did not allow a big expansion of vaccine production. These are all acts of commission. They are not acts of omission. So I think the things that have got worse are obviously because of government action. It's not just inaction. Obviously you have to have gender sensitive economic policies. I mean, it's a bit obvious to say that state government should get more resources, but at least give them their dues. They still have not got their pending GST compensation dues. It's urgent, it's urgent, urgent to universalize the PDS. Just providing five kilograms extra free per month is not good enough. You have to universalize it, not only to ration card holders, but to anyone who wants it. 10 kg per household per month for the next six months to anyone provide compensation for the lockdown, provide it again now, because it's even if it's not a nationwide lockdown, there, many states are implementing it and livelihoods are impossible now. Double the employment under household for the MNREGA, start an urban employment guarantee. The debt moratorium that was implemented, if you remember, people were saying, oh good, that's a relief. It wasn't a relief because you know what a moratorium does, it adds the interest. In other words, you don't have to pay it today, but the interest that you don't pay is going to be added to your principal. So when that moratorium ends, you get this double whammy in your case. Instead, it should have been a standstill and you could still convert it into a standstill, which means that the interest payments are suspended. They're done, you don't do them at all, you remove them. Frankly, if every all other incomes are being told that they have to cease, why should finance keep getting its incomes? Everybody else is being told no incomes for this period. You cannot work, you cannot earn your livelihood, you can't do anything. But finance will keep getting its interest payments. That's ridiculous, surely. You have to make sure fresh credit reaches the micro enterprises and they are being deprived of it. We know that many microfinance institutions and women's cooperatives are being starved of funds. I mean, the no brainer is more resources for health. We must be the only country in the world that did not increase the share of health spending as a share of GDP during the pandemic. I think we are the only country, just like we are the only country in the world that is charging people for the COVID-19 vaccines. Many, many, many things need to be done. All of them can be done quite easily. It just requires that the government change its strategy. Okay, I have already talked too much, I think, but we can take questions now. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Arsha, yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the insight. We have the audience now for any questions or any discussions that we have want to have. Yes, you can send it in the chat and then I can request from the answer. So, we have our first question from Samik Shah. She's saying that I want to ask a question on labor reports. Obviously, women are workers and they're ignored. Do you think trade unions have failed to successfully oppose the labor force? Farmers were on road for months opposing farm laws, but where were the trade unions? Yeah, you know, Samiksha, there have been feminist critiques of the labor courts. Uh, you're right that they're not getting sufficient traction. You know, the trade unions have had three major all India strikes. They don't get reported. 
very large strike. We've had the largest strikes in the world, actually, for three days. Uh, when was it? Was it January or February? Very, very, very large strikes. The Indian media don't report them. And of course, with all, everything else that is going on, it is easy to ignore these. But remember that trade unions, like, like everybody else, is operating all other forms of you know, political activity. They're operating under tremendous constraints. And you are also dealing with a population that is extremely weakened, enervated by the past year and a half of deep tragedy, and is now desperate for work of any kind. So workers have gone back to factories where they were frightened and had to, you know, and are working at half the money wages that they got earlier. So in such conditions for trade unions also to be able to achieve uh, the kinds of mobilization, it's really very difficult. I'm not saying that, um, you know, that, that more can't be done. I think definitely more can be done. The sort of federations of trade unions got together and did major national strikes, which the media ignored. So it's more than just the trade unions themselves. The trade unions have also come out in support of the farmers' agitation. And, but, you know, it's more than that. We need a bigger sort of representation of people at large rather than just those who are actively going to be affected in this. And it's also now increasingly difficult because there are very draconian laws that have been put in place in many of the state governments, Uttar Pradesh, for example, which prevent any kind of mobilization or activity and people are thrown into jail for that. So the conditions under which trade unions can mobilize have dramatically worsened. Despite that, they did try. And again, the other problem with that is that our media have, well, I mean, the less said about it, the better, but our media have never really reported worker struggles, but now it's out of the question that they would do any of that. Uh, Alicia, again. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Jagati, because uh, when you are talking about India, it is the same case in Mexico. Before COVID and now during COVID, it's incredible all the violence that women are, uh, are, uh, are having. And especially it has increased the, a lot violence at home and also the feminicides. And I don't know, maybe I think it is the same uh, thing in, in, in India. We has reduced employment. Uh, many women, they, they don't have, in Mexico, the informal employment is very high. In Latin America, it's around 60% of the labor force is unemployed, uh, uh, in informal, so they don't have a, any social protection. And, but the other thing that I will, I would like to point is that all these consequences on, on how are women and the labor force is all the austerity policies that we have had mm -hmm. during previous years, but especially after the great financial in international crisis, 20, uh, 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 2008 and 2009, mm -hmm. all the central bank policies that has been implemented to pay our external debt, they have in, uh, put, they have, uh, we have exporting a lot of money, especially mm -hmm. to the, to the funds and to the big banks. And so the public budget has been reduced in education and in, and in health. And mm -hmm. that's why COVID has shown all these, the, the wrong austerity uh, policies. And I think it, it is the same in, in India. Well, we, work on, we'll, <laughs> we can continue talking, but I will just, I would like just to say the comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia, and you're so right. You know, I think the difference in India is that we never really built up an adequate health infrastructure. Unlike Mexico, you at least had something you could destroy. We had already underspent on health. I mean, nobody believes me when I say the total government spending, central and state governments spending on health in India is 1% of GDP. They think I'm making it up, that it cannot be so low. But that is really what it has been. And the central government spent 0.3% of GDP. And last year during the pandemic, they didn't increase it. It was still 0.3% of a falling. I mean, you know, it, you cannot even begin to contemplate 
that this is what would happen. But you're right that it is a deeply neoliberal mindset. And in India, we don't even have the excuse that we had an external debt and we were forced to do it by IMF or something. No, we did it to ourselves. The government chose this completely neoliberal austerity path. <laughs> Next, we have Satvi Hajir Chauhan. You can unmute yourself, Satvi. And yes. Professor Ghosh, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. My question is, um, in India and in many parts of the world, uh, we do not consider to be equal. We treat women or other genders unequally at home. Uh, so um, we pay in a similar manner when we both go for a walk. Even your um, a data showed that during MG and IJ, uh, that there is a wage gap, which is illegal according to the law, perhaps. So how, what are the policy tools you think um, we can uh, imagine which work better in these contexts, where we don't believe in equality at all? You know, I think the first step will have to begin with public employment. Because you know that can be a basic standard bearer. First of all, we have inadequate public employment. We don't have enough of it. We under provide basic services. If you look at public employees per share of population, we are less than two per hundred compared to a global average of three and a half per hundred. And you know, Scandinavia has eight, nine per hundred, 13, I think, in Sweden. So you know, we are under providing. We have to dramatically increase public employment for all the basic services health, education, of course, but you know, security, um, agricultural extension, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many public services we're under providing. Within public employment, we have to make sure that women are treated as full proper employees getting equal wages. The governments themselves do not do this. They treat women as voluntary workers, giving honoraria, which is like a little gift of a, you know, a crumb. If we could actually ensure a tripling of necessary public employment, giving women adequate wages, proper working conditions, everything else. A lot of the other labor market conditions would change simply because that would become a kind of, you know, standard bearer for the others. So there are two things. One is that the fact that the governments themselves exploit this, this massive discrimination in the labor market to underpay women workers, that's one of the issues. But the other is that there are big multiplier effects. You put money in the hands of more workers through public employment, they generate more spending. They go out there and spend that money. And that in turn generates more demand for local goods and services and all of those things. So I believe it has to begin with public employment. Next we have Arun. Yeah, hello ma'am. By the way, I don't know if Varsha wants to come in on this because she's done a lot of work on public employment. <laughs> Yes, we do. And we have a session especially on this, on okay. public employment. <laughs> Um, it's wonderful to hear you all as always but I mean I was also reading the Nancy Fulbright book uh, uh -huh. and it was, uh, <laughs> it was nice to hear you talk about it but I I, I want to take you to a, 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 a probably a question about the you know a question about the growth story of India because rather than you know targeted uh, women-centric programs maybe you know you know this growth story of India is actually focused you know it, it is not a it is absence of jobs B there is gender relations playing. However, there is also this unequal growth in terms of, say, you told about water. There is an infrastructural problem. There is a connecting problem, transportation issue. So, you know, in general, rather than the growth of employment itself, which is a problem, also the connectors to employment for women, which, which is a very paradoxical scenario in India, probably that is also adding or intersecting into what is happening into you know, women's employment. And I, I just wanted to hear your comments on this moderator, uh, you know, the, the problem with the moderators in terms of connecting women to their uh, employment. You know, this is a, what you've touched on is actually a very profound issue in development, I would argue. And I've been having this discussion also with colleagues here and in, in a commission I'm part of where, you know, there's a fundamental way in which we have absorbed some critical elements of a neoliberal mindset. 
And I don't mean fiscal austerity. I, I think a lot of liberals and progressive economists are now agreed that fiscal austerity is bad and so on. But we have absorbed notions of, for example, productivity growth. Yeah, and that, that's a good thing. Inevitably, it's always very excellent and so on. What is productivity growth? It's GDP per worker, okay? We are miscounting both. We are miscounting GDP because we are including all kinds of things which are not necessarily desirable, whether if you know and pollution is more GDP creating than not, congested and can terrible privatized health systems are more GDP creating than a public health system, and so on and so forth, right? Finance, if it grows dramatically, you get a big increase in GDP without really anything improving the conditions of the population. So we are miscounting the numerator. But we are also miscounting the denominator. Yeah, we don't count unpaid work, we don't, you know, et cetera. I mean, all of that. So you can get situations like India, which is a great example of increasing productivity per worker uh, because we have falling employment. That cannot be a good thing, right? Yet, you know, somehow we've absorbed this and we're always looking at productivity growth as an indicator of economic progress that not only creates the kinds of disarticulation that you were talking about, you know, that uh, the, the lack of basic needs provision, the lack of amenities and infrastructure that affect conditions of life, the absence of the ability to relate income growth to job generation, you know, still, I think, even us progressive economists, many of us are stuck in that mindset, that you need growth to generate jobs. And that, you know, that's, we really have to somehow get ourselves out of this and think, what is it that we want in the economy? Let's think of a few indicators. I'm desperately searching for not 17 indicators, but a couple that we can use saying, this is our marker of progress. Let's think of that marker of progress and say, what are the things we need to get there? Because, you know, this whole thing about productivity, we all use it finally. We're looking at sectorally, nationally, we're comparing. I'm not so sure that this is the line that we should be taking. I really do believe, not that I have an answer, I don't have a nice neat you know, alternative to give you, but we have to get out of this. And you guys, you young people, you're the ones who can do this. Please, yeah, please I've been asking. Yeah, ma'am, I, I don't have an answer either, but you know, there was, uh, there was one study that I'm probably, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm planning to publish soon, but the thing is, there was this thing that I found that the dif difference in non-agricultural employment, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, the odds of women participating in non-agricultural employment considerably increases when their share of public transport in a city or a village increases. Okay, but obviously that is not an, the answer. It obviously has an individual level and a, uh, you know community level intersection for sure. But I'm saying even the, yes. the there is a problem with the employment, but there is also a problem with the connectors of connectors. You're problem. right. No, no, you're absolutely right, and especially in uh, in developing countries, I think that. The infrastructure gap, if you want to call it, that is significant, that is important, there's no doubt. But you know, there's a broader issue and that covers countries at different levels of development. If you look at the care sector as an economic activity of the future, I, I was talking about this in a commission that I'm in just three days ago, and you could see all the men in the commission, their eyes glaze over and they say, yeah, but these are low productivity activities. They are low productivity because society does not value them. They're not low productivity from a social perspective, if you see what I mean. But as long as society doesn't value them because the market doesn't value them, we will continue to think that they are low productivity. So anything we do to encourage them is a, like a little gift that we're doing, you know? So I have, a, I have a problem with both. I have a problem with the absence of the recognition of basic infrastructure needs. So it's not just connecting it's you know as you said women walking hours to collect water women walking still to collect fuel wood because they can't afford those gas cylinders etc and it is the lack of social valuation of care we have this one more attendant Sejendra has a question yeah thank you ma'am uh, for a very illustrative talk, uh, I would like to ask a, a question regarding uh, about the a framework which we still uh, you know, using in order to understand the gender inequality in India or in developing nations so far. It's not able to incorporate the, you know, the place 
uh, where a woman should get their share of uh, due, which is long, long due from the society perspective, as well as from the policy perspective. That uh, I don't find any literature and a policy that which can you know uh, get uh, correctly uh, map out how a different informal sector of economy can come together and then then they can raise a voice against this uh, atrocities which uh, they go through on daily basis actually yes tejinder you know you are right a lot of the problem though i believe in policy is that actually women don't have a voice you know uh, very rarely are the women who who will be affected by policies genuinely consulted and i don't mean those those fellow people who go dipstick survey or have a meeting and say all stakeholders were heard but nobody is actually listening i mean that you know if they are able to affect the policies and this can happen at every possible level uh, bina agarwal has very interesting study of afforestation policies and you know it was seen as a big success that we managed to do a lot more foresting and all of that but it meant a massive increase in women women walking to collect firewood because you were blocking off all the forests near the village why was this because the village forest management committees had one member of the household it was always the man right so it was seen as very dem democratic participatory but it was the men deciding and men don't collect firewood in bengal in north bengal an experiment was done with having only women of the households in that committee and they worked out a system where in fact in the nearby uh, forest they would go but it would be rationed clearly in the following hours and only so much would be taken from the following kinds of trees and they did it so they managed the afforestation without doubling the amount of time that it took them to collect firewood why simply because they had to do it they knew what was involved they could figure out a way to manage both when the men don't have to do it they don't even think of the difference you know so similarly with collecting water very rarely are women who have to collect the water even consulted about what kinds of strategies could be made available what are the kinds of investments that are needed locally even in the in the states where there is a lot of decentralized panchayat level participation women rarely have a voice in terms of determining the, even the local level spending and this goes all the way up to the bureaucracy so i don't necessarily mean that women are always right i have had women senior bureaucrats in the government of india like secretaries to the government of india tell me that oh we cannot pay anganwadi workers proper wages like employees they are all voluntary women okay what happens it, it, when there are not enough women in any organization if it's a business or a bureaucracy or anything you know it, you it's not good enough you have to have enough you have to have sufficient numbers to change the culture of that organization one or two on top makes no difference so i'm i'm a big believer in women's participation and uh, quotas actually for women at all levels of decision making because you know just having one or two and i've been there i i have been one woman in a faculty i have been one woman in a in a big international seminar i know you can't do a damn thing you have to have enough you have to have 30% out there to make a difference in terms of the voice <laughs> yes and uh, we have another person zenhi from south africa uh the says or he says i would like to find in terms of developing countries how do you think policy makers should approach child care and maternity policy yeah zenhi thank you so much and it's so interesting about south africa uh well yes you're absolutely right and um, you have less informality than india but i think it's growing right the informality and more and more women so this particular issue about child care and maternity it is such an important one because we have really uh, you know unfortunate experience in india we did a law was it 2 years ago 3 years ago maternity benefit law um 2017 yeah so 4 years ago my goodness how time i mean it's like the last 2 years just didn't happen <laughs> uh we did a law for informal sector women workers or small enterprises and so on of giving maternity benefits and what happened is that they stopped employing women you know in other words it doesn't work if you just pass a well meaning law 
you really have to make sure that there is provision. I would argue it has to be public provision. It has to be public provision for all women because why should it only be women who are working for an enterprise that hires more than 10 people? It should be all women getting a maternity benefit. It's a social function they're performing and it should be given socially. That is a proper, decent maternity benefit, not just the you know, uh, sort of ridiculous, tiny amount that doesn't even cover a monthly wage. So I would argue that childcare and maternity uh, are social functions. They require social spending and that it must be delivered by the government. Because the minute you put it onto employers, then you will get all of those bad labor market outcomes, you know, where they basically, whether they say so or not, they will employ less women. And they will make sure that they get rid of them, you know, hire them only casually and don't put them in the regular payroll so that they would have not have to pay all of those things. And especially now, post COVID, when everywhere the labor market conditions are so terrible for workers, it's all the more important to make this a public guarantee, I would argue, childcare and maternity both. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to say thank you as well. Sorry, yeah. you were. I just wanted to say thank you. Wendy, can you open your video? I would love to see you. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, you don't have to. No pressure. But... No, no, no worries. It's fine. I don't mind. Hi. <laughs> hi, hi. 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 Good. Um, I just, yes, I just want to say thank you so much because this is this ties into some of the research um, that I'm I'm doing. I'm a master's student, uh -huh. and um, I just started like my research, and I'm doing a lot of stuff with uh, women and employment, and I'm trying to do it across like developing economies. So this will be very insightful to hear what is happening in India. And uh, thank you so much for your insights on the uh, maternity policy uh, structure, because that's something that um, that's where I'm trying to look at. That's one area okay. I'm trying to look at. Yes, to try and support, because that's the thing is exactly I resonated so much with uh, something that you said in the very beginning when you said that. Um, what women do in the home, that is work. It's not just, you know, we don't just need to enter the labor force. We are a labor force, even in and of ourselves, just at the, like the things we do, washing the dishes, looking after kids, exactly. um, you know, keeping the house clean, feeding, getting, you know, the story of the women who woke up at like four in the morning and get back at 11. That is so many women's stories and that needs to be taken and seen as work. So I just wanted to say that, thank you so much. I really took a lot from this. Oh, Thank great. You. you know, Zenzi, we have done a volume on women informal workers in the developing world. And uh, it's called, uh, I'm going to just send you the, um, we, did a, we did a discussion as well, which you might be interested in, which had uh, Diane Elson and um, Marty Chen and Pasuk Pongpaichit. And there is a chapter in the book on South Africa. So, wow, okay. Yeah? So right. you might be interested in this. Very I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to put the link to the thing in the chat so that you can have a look. And um, the recent book launch that we had. Right? That's right, okay. exactly. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. For the okay. okay. I'm just going to find the link, and that will also tell you about the book. But I think the discussion was actually really interesting, so you might be interested in the discussion. I'm going to right. put that in the chat so that uh, anybody who likes to can access it. Thank Raksha, you. there is a question on uh, caste and gender. Yeah. Okay, go yeah, ahead. That's the last thing that we have yeah. because we have taken one hour. Yes, Sangeet. Yes, or... Uh, I just, Sangeet, yeah. yes, Sangeet, go ahead. Alice. So she's asking in terms of valuation of care work and other topics that we have discussed, how do we better account for the effects on caste along with gender and division of labor? You know, uh, there have actually been studies and what is good about our NSS surveys at least is that we can actually distinguish along caste lines for both paid and unpaid work. And I have to tell you that uh, also there is a student of mine who's been working on this in Jainu. She hasn't completed her thesis yet, but it's a very interesting work, which finds that in, it depends on certain states and certain occupations, but there are certain activities in which caste even trumps gender in terms of determining the degree to of wage discrimination. In other words, you know, you have all of these intertwining inequalities, these intersecting inequalities. And perhaps Ashwini will talk about this more in the next uh, sessions that you have. 
But you do find that in certain activities and in certain regions, the wage gap by caste is even greater than that by gender. And within the, among women, certain categories of, um, you know, uh, certain categories of uh, workers, the, the caste wage gap is particularly high. And what is also, I think, quite frightening is that this was found, uh, and this is done by another student, Bidisha, uh, her and PhD thesis should be available in GNU. Uh, Bidisha, um, is it Kopadhai? Uh, is it, oh dear, Bidisha Mondal. Sorry? Mondal, sorry, Bidisha Mondal, that's right. Bidisha Mondal, uh, her PhD thesis, one of the chapters looks specifically at caste in manufacturing industry. And she finds that in fact, the caste wage gaps, the gender wage gaps are of course huge, but the caste wage gaps are even higher in some activities and especially in organized manufacturing. It's quite striking actually, you know, that it, it even goes up with the size of enterprise. I mean, all kinds of really shocking results. So yes, there are people working on these. Uh, Shilpa, PR Shilpa is the one who's doing it on caste in general based on the NSS service, but her PhD is not done yet. Bidisha's, uh, one of her chapters is specifically on caste uh, in determining these gaps in organized manufacturing. And I think it's quite alarming the kinds of results that she finds. So yes, there is a very clear intersecting of these inequalities. And as I said, in some cases, caste even trumps gender. It's not even just, you know, that both are important. So yeah, it's quite significant. Samiksha, have I published I this anywhere? No, but you know, please use the PowerPoint uh, as you wish. <laughs> and please do share it with everyone. Yeah. yeah, the video will be shared. Please share the PPT also. And I've sent the link of Nam's book in the chat right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Thank you, Varsha. That's good. Yeah. Uh, so we had asked one hour of Nam's precious time, and we are almost time, time to close now. Thank you, everyone who joined. Thank you so much, Nam for giving us our time and insights on this area. Let me, let, let me add to that, ma'am. Uh, I mean, it's always been a pleasure listening to you, your, your youthfulness, your enthusiasm, and your, you know, your wonderful critics backed by facts is always inspiring to every scholar. So thank you so much for being part of today's webinar. In fact, we are going to, this at least is going to be a, a, a three, three month long uh, program. Uh, you know, every week we're going to uh, invite lectures and we really hope with this enthusiastic start that you gave us you know we can have a lot more young scholars talking about it writing about it and actually finding uh you know issues you know actually trying to solve these issues so thank you so well, much thank you you know i'm sure alicia will agree with me all you young people you are our hope and we're just so grateful that you're all around and you're doing this i mean honestly thank you for doing this keep it up and i'm really waiting to see all the excellent stuff you're going to produce so. Thank you so much. And in between all the bad news of COVID uh, and tomorrow we have the election results, hopefully we find out some, right. something new. Yeah. Uh, look, <laughs> even, even the bad stuff, even this shall pass. Yeah. And you guys, as I said, you're our hope. So keep it up. <laughs> yes. For all the participants, we'll be having such seminar series every Saturday we are planning. So we'll be sending you a link and hope you're all there together. Bye, everyone. See you. Bye, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just so lovely to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 I'm very happy to see you and all of them. Thank you. Yeah, really. Bye.